So I'd like to talk a little bit about environmental review and how permitting affects trout and trout affects permitting. And so I'd like to frame this discussion today with a couple of questions. How are wild trout streams managed, protected, or regulated? And who manages wild trout streams? So this is the list of agencies that we most often see out there protecting water quality. Whether directly or indirectly, they're also managing wild trout streams. The two agencies that I'd like to focus on today are the Department of Environmental Protection and, of course, the Fish and Boat Commission. So that was the easy answer to, the, to one of those questions. Now we're going to get into kind of the, the fun part of this, and we're going to talk about a couple of chapters under Title 25 in the PA Code, um, some regulatory language authorized under DEP's jurisdiction. And so I want to talk about Chapter 93, Water Quality Standards, in Chapter 105, Dam Safety and Waterway Management. I'm also going to briefly touch at the end on, on and we've heard a little bit about this today, um, some of our statements of policy with tributary linkage. So I'll touch briefly on that at the end. And just so everybody is aware that the Fish and Boat Code, under the Fish and Boat Code, we also have some jurisdiction for um, waterway protection of property and waters under our pollution laws. So what we rarely think of, but I think is extremely important, is that the Department of Environmental Protection and the Fish and Boat Commission share a cooperative role in wild trout stream protection and management. And so, so far this morning, we've heard about the definition of a wild trout stream, so we all have a pretty good idea of what that means. We've heard about the distribution of wild trout streams. We've, we've seen maps. Dave Nyhart has done a great job with those maps. We've talked about miles of wild trout streams, biomass criteria of wild trout streams. So that's a lot of good information that our fisheries folks gather, that our environmental services folks get to put into play when it comes to permit reviews. And so that's what I want to talk about now. So the first chapter that we want to talk about is Chapter 93, Water Quality Standards. And I'm going to guess that anybody sitting out here in the audience today that's worked on a Growing Greener grant, a Cold Water Heritage Program grant, or any number of other funding grant mechanisms is probably familiar with Chapter 93, or at least with parts of Chapter 93, and certainly with the uh, aquatic life designations. And so Chapter 93, if you're not familiar with it, is essentially a compilation of streams with aquatic life use designations associated with those streams. And there are, based on water quality in those streams, these are the designations that we most often see. And so within those designations, some of the more important side, the most important side of it to us are special protection waters. It's often our goal to increase water quality protection by raising those aquatic life use designations to a higher standard, which makes it more rigorous for industry or for anybody really that wants to impact that water quality. And so it's a very important part of what we've heard about this morning, the listing of wild trout streams, whether it's through unassessed waters, our fish management section, uh, or DEP's data, um, the listing of those wild trout streams is critical to water quality protection. So for high quality waters, for instance, there are a number of ways to qualify a stream to be classified or designated as high quality. There are chemical parameters that can be met. There um, is, a, is a benthic macroinvertebrate qualifier that can be met. But th there's also the class A biomass criteria parameter. And from our perspective, and I think probably from our perspective in this room today, that's probably the most important perspective, or the most important parameter for us to try to achieve. So when we go out and we do a survey, when the Unassist Waters Program identifies a, a stream out there with a Class A biomass, then it comes to my shop, to our shop, to forward that information to DEP to have that water quality protection designation increase. The same can be said somewhat for exceptional value. Now, exceptional value is the highest water quality protection given to a stream in Pennsylvania by the DEP. 
the one important qualifier, and, and again, we have similar qualifiers for that um, benthic macroinvertebrate community qualifier. Um, and discharge, there's a discharge qualifier in there that's not quite as easy to explain or understand, but the most important part, I think, for our uh, purposes today is, is the wilderness trout stream qualifier. And so that's a, a Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission designation to a stream, and we've, we've heard some about that and saw the map. That automatically qualifies the stream as exceptional value. And so I think it's important to understand that those are incredibly important regulatory benefits uh, of listing wild trout streams. And I also think that it's a credit to everybody sitting in this room that's worked on the NSS Waters Program, that's worked on a stream habitat improvement project, that's worked on, on any TU project that's increased the, the water quality protection designation of a, of, a tra of a stream, because now we have an added uh, regulatory protection. I'm going to shift gears slightly and talk about Chapter 105, uh, Dam Safety and Waterway Management. Chapter 105 isn't as common. Uh, it's, it's, it's an industry, it's a regulatory, it's a resource agency kind of uh, discussion, but the DEP regulates water obstructions and encroachments involving streams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands. And within that statement, there are a couple of uh, definitions I'd like to point out. Water obstruction, for instance, is anything located in, along, across, or projecting into a watercourse, floodway, or body of water. And those examples would be bridges, culverts, fills, piers, embankments. This would be an example of that, of that obstruction. An encroachment is any structure or activity that changes the course, current, or cross-section of a body of water. When we see that out there, it's often channel relocations, dredging, gravel bars, removals, wetland or fill excavations. And so on the, uh, on the left, we see, certainly we see a change in, in, in uh, stream channel there. And in fact, if, uh, if there are any God's Country chapter members here today, you might recognize that, that stream channel. This area here is wetland fill. It's also, a, um, as we know, wetlands are critical components to our watersheds. So these are the kinds of activities are, that are regulated in Chapter 105. Now, when we think about the Fish and Boat Commission's role, and we'll get to that in a second, there are a couple of ways that we get into the permit process itself. There are a number of legal authorizations and protections, um, construction requirements and procedures, operation and maintenance of the activity that is being permitted, or special conditions of the permit itself. So our role in this permit process, at least by statute, is compliance by the dam, water obstruction, or encroachment with applicable laws administered by the Department of Fish and Boat Commission and River Basin Commissions created by Interstate Compact 25 PA Code 105.14 B6. That's exactly the thought that I would get, you know, the look that I would get back. The question is, really, what in the world does that mean? Um, what that essentially means is that the Fish and Boat Commission does not issue encroachment permits. That's the EP's job. We review those permit applications. We are a commenting agency. We have the opportunity to bring our environmental concerns into the permit and protection of those resources. And so some of the concerns that we have when we review a permit are proper population identification and critical life history attributes. And so we want to protect spawning. We want to protect egg development in the gravel during the, you know, the, the uh, red development period. And we also want to protect fry escapement. We want to make sure that those fish can escape the gravel for the entire period that they've been in there. We're also interested in habitat. We want to make sure that we buffer trout streams adequately and properly or projects within those trout streams. We're concerned about, and we've heard about ecosystem connectivity today, we're concerned about ecosystem connectivity in this permit, and we're also concerned about recreation for the end user, for all of us, so that when we're not sitting here in this room and we're out there trying to catch a fish on a trico at this time of year, we know we can do it based on the best water quality we have. So one of the mechanisms that we use to protect those critical life history 
uh, attributes. Those, the part of that life cycle that's most important, that's the defining factor for trout populations, are in-stream construction restriction periods. And so on wild trout streams, we can prohibit work in a wild trout stream from October 1 through December 31st and extend it a little bit further out to April 1st in a Class A wild trout stream. And when you think about that, the power of that permit and the power of that trout population is actually limiting any kind of work that can be done in that stream. Again, it just goes to say how, to, to talk about how critical it is to identify trout streams. We're also concerned, of course, about fish passage, and I want to talk briefly about some box culvert designs. And I'm going to just talk very briefly about a collaborative effort, and I know Wayne Cobra's here, and, and Wayne was a part of this from the beginning, a collaborative effort that the Fish and Boat Commission had with uh, the Department of Transportation. This was a traditional culvert. I'm sure Wayne would agree with that from years ago. Pretty flat sheet flow across that. It's very efficient at moving water, not so good for moving fish or other organisms. This is where we had hoped to go, and this is pretty much where we are today. So what happened was the Fish and Boat Commission biologists worked with some DOT engineers. We met, made, did some measurements, looked at what was important in a trout stream from stream slope to gradient to culvert design, what we needed to put in that bottom of that culvert, and essentially came up with a very successful design that's actually in PennDOT's design manual. So it's used across the state by, by PennDOT engineers as a, as a standard manual or as a standard design. And what that's done is it's provided a standardized fish passage mechanism across the state of Pennsylvania, at least on the state transportation system, which is important to recognize because we've talked about that ecosystem connectivity with, with culvert assessments, but we're talking about much smaller culvert designs. At least we know we can do these on larger culverts. And so just quickly, some of the benefits of, of that collaborative effort was the elimination of sheet flow through those structures, bed load movement through those structures to make sure that we were continually seeing trans the, the transport of sediment down through the structure itself and not blocking it, and fish and aquatic life passage and uh, that supported ecosystem connectivity. Anybody see a fish in there? There's one last thing I'd like to talk about uh, before we break for lunch, and that is another protection mechanism uh, within Chapter 105. The language in 105 indicates that wetlands are located in or along the floodplain of a reach of a wild trout stream. Again, it's important to recognize the fact that we need to identify wild trout streams. And the floodplain of streams tributary there too, and we've heard that mentioned earlier today those wetlands are protected as exceptional value. Slightly different than the Chapter 93 water quality designation, but still protected as exceptional value in the permit process, making it extremely difficult to impact those wetlands. To give you an example, the, the stream demarcated in blue is the, is the wild trout stream. The stream in this highlighted area, or the rest of this watershed, has yet to be identified as a wild trout stream or, or having a wild trout population. But if you notice these red blotchy areas, these are wetlands in that watershed. Because we've listed this stream as a wild trout stream, documented its fish population, these wetlands are protected as exceptional value. That's, that's a big deal when it comes to wetland protection for water quality for this, the trout population downstream and habitat as well when those fish use that tributary for that seasonality concept that we've heard about earlier. So the benefits of, of the entire uh, permit process and program are aquatic resource protection. It's aquatic resource protection from that biological point of view and from a physical point of view. And it's also important to provide the end user that same type of recreational benefit. Um, so that's, that's the goal of what we do when we talk about Fishing Creek, by the way. That's the goal of what we do when we talk about permit process and, and wild trout streams. And that's what I have today.